I'm Infamous Fear and this is Period Drama Drama. Today we're going to be talking about a rather specific genre of period drama, women doing things. Now this may seem a little strange to you owing to the fact that our perception of the past is one of a time when women didn't really do much except be wives and mothers or aspiring wives and mothers. And indeed, your standard stereotypical period drama does tend to revolve around women falling in love and getting married. Because as we all know, there's no possible reason to watch period drama other than for the chance to see women walking around in pretty dresses. And guys with sideburns from cravats. And tight pants. And big fancy houses. But anyway, today I'm not going to be talking about this sort of period drama. Despite the lack of female-centred history being taught in the average history class, women did actually have a hand in accomplishing things before 1960. The first computer programmer was a woman. Several popular authors of genre fiction works were women. There were female photographers, scientists, explorers, painters, film directors, social activists and entrepreneurs. And I'm only mentioning famous women. Period dramas tend to focus more on social history. In other words, examining the fabric of society as it was at a particular time, rather than focusing on major world events. Hell, even movies and television series that are about particular historical events do tend to twist the content in order to be about particular characters, rather than the event as a whole. Throughout society, women have been heavily involved in accomplishing things, particularly women from lower social classes. Workers in industrial, mining and agricultural sectors did not have the luxury of telling women that they were incapable of work. There was work to be done, crops to be harvested, rocks to be broken and money to be made, and there weren't always enough men to do it. Nowhere is this truer than it is in wartime. When all of the able-bodied men are off employed in active duty, the powers that be don't really have a choice. Which just goes to show that societal rules are pretty easy to ignore in the face of necessity. Factory workers are ladylike, unless of course we have to blow up enough Germans. In which case, ladies, you can do it! You can wear lipstick while constructing fuselage. If it's good enough for Norma Jean, it's good enough for you. As a consequence, most of the period dramas about women doing things are set in wartime, and there's a lot of potential for these kind of stories. The setting provides us with a female heavy ensemble cast who have a unifying goal and purpose that is unrelated to marriage or fulfilling female obligations. During the war, they have the freedom to be whoever they want, and society has to grit its teeth and bear it because there is no other option. Everything changes to accommodate this new need for women in the workforce, from clothing, morals and societal obligations. A war is a strange intermediary period in the social fabric and brings with it new challenges, some of them exciting opportunities and some of them horrible losses. All in all, an excellent setting for a television series. So with that in mind, let's look at one of the better television series about wartime women doing things. This is Bomb Girls. Tomorrow, when the world is free. Ah yes, Bomb Girls. This is a recent Canadian television series about women employed at a munitions factory in World War II. In 1941, Gladys Witham, a wealthy young woman leading a sheltered existence, decides to join Victory Munitions to work in the office and help the war effort. While there, she decides to become more involved and secretly joins the women on the factory floor, helping to make bombs and getting to know a diverse group of working women, all of which are affected by the war in different ways. But this isn't just the story of one woman. This is an ensemble cast. So let's find out a little more about the lives of these adorable Canadians. We have four main characters. Lorna, the floor matron at the factory. Betty, one of the most competent workers there the naive, sheltered Kate, and Gladys, who I mentioned before, as well as a whole bunch of auxiliary characters who I'll try and discuss as quickly as possible. Also, as a warning, this is a television series still currently airing, so I can't possibly know about the bits that I haven't seen. Gladys. Gladys is our naive, pretty every woman. She's new to the world of work, and is doing the whole patriotic duty for a lark, rather than through a need to support herself. As a consequence, several of the other characters find her rather out of touch with the whole working class experience. Edith, you were saying you had some ideas on how to make this place better? No idea what you're talking about. Just wanted him to see things the way we do. We? We? It's not your ass that's gonna get kicked out the door. And who feeds my kids then, huh? 
Why don't you take a hike? See if there's a girl guide troop somewhere that's short of patrol leader. In terms of a standard period drama lead female, Gladys is the closest we have. She's this series Lady Mary, with her looks, her wealth and her privilege, and her status as the special one. However, this story is not merely about Gladys desperately trying to find a husband. She already has a fiancé, and the series starts out with her begging him to fuck her. She doesn't need to marry for a secure future either. She's the heir to a large fortune, but unlike Mary, she actually decides to do something instead of sitting back and waiting to inherit. Gladys is a spirited woman who actually wants to affect social change. She might be naive and lack understanding about how the world operates for the average person, but she's at least prepared to embrace the more socially challenging aspects of the war. Unlike her bitchy friend Carol, a woman with a tiny face. Sorry, Mr. Higgins, crank call. And who fell for that ruse? It was Vera, sir. But one can hardly blame her. She wouldn't know what a real transatlantic phone call sounds like. Gladys has a good realistic relationship with her fiancé in terms of expecting him to respect her, but not baby or protect her. I'm no saint. And if you can't stop seeing me like that, this will never work. And she demands accountability from her parents. You've no clue the compromises that come with doing business. I know all about compromise, Father. Doing the right thing for as many people as possible. She is also a very understanding friend to the other factory girls, even if they are reluctant to accept her at first. However, there's just one issue I have with Gladys. She seems to have absolutely no fidelity at all. Now, I accept that a lot of people are led around life by their genitals, particularly when they're young and hormonal. And I also understand that in wartime, there is a tendency for the rules, such as they are, to be cast out the window. Which is why there are so many STI-related propaganda posters. I'm not terribly bothered by Gladys getting a little carried away, and telling a handsome young airman that she'll marry him after a giddy night of dancing, since it's hardly any worse than Gladys's fiancé catching gonorrhea from one of her colleagues. But what I am bothered by is Gladys's continued tendency to flirt with anyone who has a penis. This becomes particularly bad when she ends up having a fling with the most hideously obnoxious character on the show, Gene Corbett, a man so irritating and douchey he's basically the personification of a Nickelback song, despite the fact that there's nothing to like about him, other than the fact that he's maybe vaguely handsome, or at least about as much as every other man on the show. Great choice there, Gladys. If you were going to cheat on your fiancé for no reason at all, couldn't you have at least picked a character who doesn't inspire the viewer to try and reach into the television screen and shred his face? More on Gene Corbett later, because you'd better believe that I can't even begin to cover the giant breadth of his awfulness with just a mere sentence or two. Anyway, Gladys is a pretty good everywoman, but her intelligence and her social progressiveness are somewhat undermined by her consistently stupid decisions. Lorna. Lorna Corbett is the floor matron at Victory Munitions, a woman who supervises the production line and makes sure that nobody blows their own face off. Rather than embracing war work and a patriotic whim like Gladys, Lorna is used to being in the workforce through sheer necessity, owing to the fact that she is the primary breadwinner for the family, since her husband is a paraplegic veteran of the First World War. At times she can be a little humourless and by the book, but Lorna deeply cares about the health and well-being of the women who work under her, and loves and supports her family. She's capable, organised, emotionally nuanced, and highly competent. An excellent representation of a working mother. Vera risked her life every day to help win this war. Do not turn your back on her. If you want to see our boys with bullets in their guns and bombs in their planes, you will show her the same respect. You book the operating room and you do the surgeries, no matter how expensive or lengthy. You do your best for that girl. You'll be a role model, Betty. If we want good workers, we need to show them what one looks like. Never imagined they would do this. Shows you what a freak I am. I have to make a whole set of lies about me. You listen to me, Betty. You are a skilled, hardworking, decent girl, and that's what women who watch this will see. That's what they'll want to be. Unfortunately, the writers of the series decided to give Lorna some more female problems. Lorna's character flaws are revealed when she begins to butt heads with another factory worker, an Italian-born chemist by the name of Marco Moretti. Initially, she is suspicious of his Italian descent and tries to get him fired from Victory Munitions during a routine inspection, but later he begins to hit on her. And like most female characters, when confronted with an attractive man, regardless of whether he's a deserving one or not, 
she is helpless to his charms. You know, despite the fact that she has a husband whom she clearly cares for. I guess like most of the women on the show, she was just horny. Happens to the best of us? Except for the fact that most people learn to control their impulses and don't just jump the bones of whoever they find attractive? Especially when they have dependent spouses at home? As a result of this tryst with Marco, Lorna falls pregnant, and as with pretty much every pregnant character in a TV or movie series, abortion is not really an option. I understand it more in this circumstance, because this predates legal abortion, and back alley abortion wasn't terribly safe. But don't worry, because Lorna doesn't have to have the baby. Instead, she suffers a deus ex miscarriage. So all's well that ends well, I guess. Except for the fact that it could have been easily avoided with one of these. In the future, you may want to make use of prophylactics. Oh well, at least they dealt with Lorna's life decisions in a much more sensible and mature way than they handled Gladys's insatiable sexual desire. Vera. Vera starts the series as a bubbly, flirtatious and likeable factory worker whose life is dramatically changed when she has the top of her head torn off in a horrific factory accident. Accident? It's just no accident. Vera is rushed to hospital, but even after reconstructive surgery, she is visibly scarred. As a consequence, she suffers depression and decides to commit suicide, only to give the sleeping pills to a co-worker who suffered severe injuries in a subsequent workplace incident. But even though she has decided to live, Vera's life has hardly been restored to what it was before. She decides to return to her estranged family, but is persuaded to rejoin Victory Munitions by her concerned colleagues. Understandably, Vera suffers from some pretty severe PTSD and finds herself unable to work on the factory floor, managing instead to secure herself a position in the office using her sex appeal as a bargaining chip. Oh, I'm sure Lorna can find you a suitable position on the floor. She can't do much, Mr. Aikens. That's, um, why I'm asking you. And now let's talk about Vera and sex. Following her return to the factory, Vera no longer goes to bars with her friends, but instead finds refuge in the anonymity of the street, looking for soldiers to share the night with. At first she finds it hard to gain attention. Despite the fact that she's hardly as grotesque as one of Albert Tucker's Victory Girls, and they didn't seem to have any problem, but eventually she finds success and continues to sleep with men in return for meals, gifts and companionship, as well as for a sense of validation, to feel that she's worth something despite the fact that she may not be as flawless as before. And you know what? Good for her! I may have criticised Lorna and Gladys for their sexual dalliances, but they had partners they were cheating on. Vera knows exactly what she is doing. She doesn't expect romantic attachment. She isn't breaking any promises to anyone, and if soldiers can have consequence-free sex, why can't she? Vera's a tough woman, and despite the fact that she's continually judged for her appearance, her perceived lower class, and her liberal sexual behaviour, she still keeps her head up and remains a strong and confident character, despite the fact that she's arguably gone through a much more horrific experience than anyone else on the show. Vera, I may not be a soldier, but if I give you these, will you give me 20 minutes in the storeroom? 20 minutes, Donald? Where it is, you've never gone longer than three. <laughs> Keep them. They'll look better on you anyway. She goes from being an arguably forgettable character to one of the most interesting characters on the show. I challenge anyone else to have their scalp ripped off and do any better. Kate. And now we go from one of our strongest, most self-assured characters to one of our least confident ones. Kate is the daughter of some kind of Canadian Fred Phelps, a fire and brimstone preacher who exploits his family and makes them talk about sin on street corners. Much like, well, Fred Phelps. She manages to escape, form a new identity and find a position working at Victory Munitions. Kate has become firm friends with Betty and embraces the more free and liberal lifestyle she now has access to, but she's still in conflict with her more restrictive upbringing and can't quite let go of the idea of sin. You have a new life here. What kind of life? I make things that kill people. I debase God's gift, I sing in dens of sin, I drink, smoke, consort with deviants. You're free. I was seduced. Also, she has a habit of randomly singing, which can be a little jarring, because it makes you think that the show is going to turn into an impromptu musical. My mother walked 
reach that lonesome valley She had to walk it by herself We gotta walk it by ourselves Kate is one of the characters on the show who is the hardest for a modern audience to identify with owing to the fact that she is so sheltered, nervous and repressed. Unlike all the other main characters on the show who seem to know exactly what they want or who and they will just go out and get it, whether it's advisable or not, Kate doesn't seem to really know what she's interested in and completely ignores the two people who would arguably be the best partners for her, depending on what gender she's into, in favour of focusing on the tumbling dickweed Jean Corbett. But I can't talk any more about why this is a horrible decision without first talking about some of the other characters. So let's leave Kate for a moment. Betty. What can I say about Betty? She's the most consistently competent character on the show, who makes the least stupid decisions. She's sarcastic, badass, confident, and she's just about the best lesbian character ever. Now this may seem a strange thing to say about a character in an ensemble cast who gets maybe a fourth or a fifth of every episode's screen time, but Betty really is one of the most well-rounded and realistic lesbian characters I have experienced in any form of media. There are two common ways to depict lesbian characters in movies and television. One is that she's a very naive person who will only become aware of her sexuality when she falls in love with another woman and immediately becomes intimate with her. The other is a lesbian character who is so experienced that she manages to sleep with just about every woman who crosses her path with ridiculous levels of ease, despite the fact that rather than living in some kind of lesbian ghetto, she lives in a 19th century coal mining town! And I'm just talking about good lesbian characters rather than evil lesbians or fan service lesbians. Betty, on the other hand, has a much more realistic character arc. She has clearly been aware of her homosexuality for quite some time and is about as self-assured about it as she could be considering the circumstances. You gotta be kidding me. Once her husband comes home from fighting Jerry, she'll be happy to return to her wifely duties. You mean newsreels, not fairy tales. Look here, killer. What we want is the lie. Love, war, the whole damn thing is the lies that stitch it all together. And I can tell from here, you do your share every day. She develops a pretty obvious crush on Kate from the start, and the relationship progresses incredibly naturally. Betty is friendly, supportive, and helpful towards Kate. In short, she acts with the same doting manner as anyone would towards someone they were hesitantly interested in. And the two girls grow closer and closer to each other. I have been saving for a place like this since I started working. Why? That's what husbands are for. Do you ever want something of your own? I just dream of a place of my own. And now, thanks to the war, I stand a chance of getting it. Of course, I'd need housemates. Eventually, after six episodes, Betty decides that it's possible that Kate might like her too, only to find that Kate is interpreting her romantic interest as friendship, and once her true intentions become clear, Kate is less than impressed with Betty's affections. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's stupid. I, 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 I just, I thought that's disgusting, and if you can't see that, then you're disgusting too. As a result, Betty experiences something of a crisis in confidence and decides that she'll try and be straight. She begins dating Ivan, but the two of them spend most of their dates talking about hockey, because this is Canada, and when you don't want to sleep with someone, you distract them with winter sports. Go Leafs! Go Leafs! Why are they called the Maple Leafs? Leafs is not the plural of leaf! Anyway, Ivan is relatively patient, but eventually decides that Betty is being too cagey and nervous about sexual contact, and the two have terrible, awkward sex. I'm sorry, Ivan. Really, I am. Do you know how many girls would jump at this chance? We're meant for other people, Ivan. Look, Ivan, I'm sorry. I just can't go up with a man who has a penis. Yes, it turns out that the fantasy of having heterosexual sex with a lesbian is a stupid one, owing to the fact that it won't be any good and she won't enjoy it. Surprise! Thankfully, Betty does end up having some kind of fulfilment when she catches the eye of a war bonds woman. Hey, it's okay. We don't need to do anything here. No, I want to. This happened so fast. 
Seems to me you've waited a long time. Betty knows what she wants, but is completely unable to get it. So she isn't sexually experienced. And it actually makes sense. I mean, why would she be some kind of sexual etheria when she lives in World War II Canada? Need I remind you that lesbianism is the worst possible sexuality when it comes to interpreting romantic attachment? The relationship between Kate and Betty is a very clear example of this. What one girl reads as friendship, the other reads as romance. Girls have a tendency to be more affectionate, which means that, short of directly asking, it's very hard to know whether a girl's interest in you is friendly or sexual until her tongue is in your mouth. And that's in this day and age, when people can be a lot more open about their sexuality. Imagine how hard it would be to get sexual experience when you're a lesbian in the 1940s and you live in the real world. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't know about your sexuality, but it does mean that you probably wouldn't be able to pursue it. And thus, this is why Betty is one of the most well-developed, realistic lesbian characters ever. It's just a sorry state of affairs that it's as rare as it is to have a female LGBT character who is so well-developed, and she's one of an ensemble cast on a period drama. And now that we've talked about one of the best characters on the show, it's only appropriate that we turn our attention to the very worst. Jean Corbett is Lorna Corbett's son, a decorated airman who recently achieved the rank of sergeant. He's also a completely irredeemable shithead. But why just say that when I can prove that Jean Corbett is the worst character in the history of ever? So I said, I'll take care of the fire if you uh, take care of that striptease. <laughs> <laughs> He's a sex-obsessed, self-absorbed jerk who flirts with every single woman in eyeshot, whether she wants it or not, and can't take no for an answer, even when she tells him to go away multiple times. His mother hosts a dinner for him and he shows up, sticks his stupid fingers in every dish in the kitchen, is a jerk to his sister's date, including chastising him for being a doctor, which apparently means he isn't doing enough to help the war effort, even though being a doctor is a pretty fucking vital occupation, particularly when people are out there blowing ragged holes in each other. And then after all the effort his mother has gone to, he walks out on the family, stealing their liquor, flying the coop so that he can go and bust into Betty's house and force her to have an impromptu party. What all do you got to eat? You've already emptied the icebox. Well, I skipped dinner, so... Oh, you're welcome to go home and eat your own food anytime you like. He disregards his mother and he treats Betty like she has an obligation to accommodate him, despite the fact that this is her house and he's eating all of her food. Then, during the evening, he repeatedly hits on Gladys, despite her telling him to stop and that she has a fiancé. Later, he prank calls Gladys, pretending to be her fiancé, purely so that he can spout crude sexual innuendos down the line and imply that her fiancé is cheating on her. Have you seen any action yet? Plenty. Backstage at the Windmill Theatre. All those naked showgirls. S sorry what? Ha ha! What a height of wit! But that's not even the height of Gene Corbett's magical mystery tour of douchebaggery. He bullies Gladys into taking him for a drive in her fiancé's expensive car, and then while driving he commandeers the car and drives directly into the path of an oncoming vehicle, nearly killing both of them! That's what it feels like. Your heart beating like that? Your life right on the edge? That's what it feels like to fly. behind this terrible, stupid romance is that he's fun! Fun? How? How the hell is he fun? Okay, so he plays the piano. And he likes partying. And he gave her a beer. Ah, uh, so? So did all of her friends and they actually respected her boundaries, looked out for her and didn't try to get her fucking killed! There's the implication that Gladys needs to let her hair down, but she already does! She has fun with her friends. She has fun with her fiancé. Her life is not lacking in fun, and Jean Corbett is about as fun and exciting as getting an impromptu wedgie! Okay, for argument's sake, let's compare Jean Corbett the raging prick to another smug period drama jerk. Thomas may be pretty nasty at times, but at least he has a reason to be that way. And really, what did he ever do that was that horrible? 
Yes, he hit on a guy who didn't want it, but when he learned the attention was unwanted, he backed away as quickly as possible. Unlike someone else, he might have wanted to get someone fired, but he never tried to get someone killed. How come you're not fighting in the war? I mean, you got working arms and legs, huh? At least Thomas has the capacity to care about people who he loves. Thomas would never walk out on his mother's dinner. Thomas would never gate crash somebody's house and force them to have a party, whether they liked it or not. That's Andrew WK's job. And here's the crucial part. He, unlike Jean, is not exactly showered with accolades at all times. Whenever Thomas does something horrible or misguided, karma catches up with him, whereas everything Jean does barely warrants a mild reprimand. Thomas is not viewed by the audience as good, whereas there's the implication that the other characters like Jean for some reason, and we, the audience, are supposed to view him as likeable. The only other character on the show who is so consistently horrible is Carol, Gladys's bitchy friend. But whenever Carol does anything a bit mean or snide, behaviour that merely extends to her being slightly bitchy, rather than directly disregarding someone's boundaries and endangering their life, she experiences some kind of comeuppance. Are you fond of shrimp cocktail, Miss Burr? Yes. I treat myself to them every birthday at the Arcadian Court. The cafeteria at Simpsons? What's Christmas dinner? A hamburger at Franz? <laughs> Mr. Mears. Any shoulder to the wheel is one deserving respect, Mr. Mears. Whereas nothing has happened to Jean. Nothing! There's one potentially mitigating circumstance to Jean's reckless behaviour, and that's that he suffers from PTSD. Big fucking deal. No, stay with me here. I'm not discounting post-traumatic stress disorder, and indeed, in the series, the damage war causes to a veteran psyche is pretty evident. What I'm saying is that PTSD does not explain why Gene is such an inflammatory jerk, because from the sounds of it, he was a spoilt shithead even before he went to war. Gene's made a fool out of you. You're the only one who can't see it. He's as selfish and as stubborn as he was when he was a little boy. If his own father and sister say so, I'm pretty inclined to believe them. Gene was a jerk, is a jerk, and will probably always be a jerk. And I can only hope that he eats a bomb in the next series, so that I never have to see his stupid face ever again. The show in general. The first World War II period drama I remember watching was set in Canada, and it's always good to see some more Canadian content. The Canadian setting is also more identifiable to an Australian viewer, owing to the fact that Canada is also a Commonwealth country, and in World War II was also in the war prior to America joining the Pacific Theatre of Conflict. Plus, it's also good to have some more wartime drama that isn't about the Holocaust or the American perspective. Also, Canadians are awesome and adorable. I don't get it. What's so adorable about Canadians? What a loon, eh? Anyway, period dramas vary in how hard-hitting they are, and Bomb Girl strikes a pretty good balance between light and comedic, and more mature and serious. It's not particularly explicit, but the way the show handles the implications of a war, and the personal relationships of the characters, still comes across as serious and genuine. Compare this, on the other hand, to the superficially similar Land Girls, a relatively recent British period drama about women in the auxiliary force. In Land Girls, the premise of city girls on a farm is exploited for comedic slapstick purposes, whereas you can't really pull off slapstick in a bomb factory unless you want your show to veer into the territory of forklift driver Klaus. This is a minor workplace incident in Land Girls. <laughs> This, on the other hand, is a minor workplace incident in Bomb Girls. <laughs> Notice the difference? One is presented as a far more serious and potentially dangerous situation than the other, which is what you'd expect when you're dealing with the manufacture of munitions. In the first episode of Land Girls, a woman sleeps with some jerk under false pretenses. Whereas in the first episode of Bomb Girls, a character is distracted by a man's flirtation and gets half of her scalp ripped off. So when it comes to life-changing personal experiences, i.e. the source of drama in period drama, I'm going to have to hand it to Bomb Girls. In terms of period accuracy, Bomb Girls seems very thoroughly well-researched. 
Some of the wartime slogans have been Americanized due to greater familiarity with American slogans, but the show setting is still very distinctly Canadian. The costumes are excellent and the general mood is very well done. There are a few obvious errors and there are some excellent details, such as Lorna's use of a mimeograph machine to print leaflets. Nothing gets me more excited than seeing some old-fashioned forms of typography and information duplication! So that was Bomb Girls, and if you'll excuse me, I've got to go and lock all of the doors. I just have this strange feeling that an entitled Canadian dipshit is going to burst into my house and hijack my piano. Let me play you my newest composition. It's called Free Jazz!